Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to the Infosys Limited Earnings Conference Call. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen-only mode. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchtone phone. After today's presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. To ask a question, you may press star then one on your telephone keypad. To withdraw your question, please press star then two. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Sandeep Mahindru. Thank you and over to you, sir. Thanks, Linda. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Infosys Financial Results for Q4 and FY23. Joining us here on this call is CEO and MD Mr. Salil Parekh, CFO Mr. Nilanjan Rai, and other members of the senior management team. We'll start the call with some remarks on the performance of the company for the recently concluded quarter in year by Salil and Nilanjan, subsequent to which the call will be opened up for questions. Please note that anything that we say that refers to our outlook for the future is a forward looking statement. That must be read in conjunction with the risk that the company faces. A full statement explanation of these risks is available in our filings with ICC, which can be found on www.icc.gov. I would now like to pass it on to Chalan. Thanks, Sandeep. Good evening and good, good morning to everyone on the call, and thank you for joining us. Uh, for the full year, financial year 2023, we are a good performance uh, with growth of 15.4% in constant currency. Our digital business grew 25.6%, now being 62.9% of our overall revenue. And our core services grew as well at 1.9%. We saw broad base growth across our business segments with most in double digits. We had 26% growth in Europe and 12% in the US. With 95 large deals with a value of 9.8 billion for the year with 40% net revenue. Our operating margin for the full year was at 21%. We generated free cash flow of $2.5 billion in the year. Our attrition has continued to decline in each of the quarters through the year. We are leveraging generated AI capabilities for our clients and within the company. We have active projects with clients working with generated AI platforms to address specific areas within their business. We have trained open source generative AI platforms on our internal software development library. We anticipate generative AI to provide more opportunities for work with our clients and to enable us to improve our productivity. In Q4, we saw changes in the market environment during the quarter, we saw unplanned project ramdowns in some of our clients and delays in decision making, which resulted in lower volumes. In addition, we had some one time revenue impact. While we saw some signs of stabilization in March, the environment remained uncertain. This led to a Q4 year on year growth of 8.8% in constant currency and quarter-on-quarter quarter decline of 3.2%. Our operating margin was at 21% for the quarter, and we had $2.1 in large deals in the quarter. We generated $713 million of free cash flow in the quarter. A pipeline of large deals is extremely strong. Several of these are mega deals, and several of these opportunities are for cost and efficiency programs and for consolidation projects. Some industries such as financial services in mortgages, asset management, investment banking, uh, telecom, high tech, and retail are more impacted, leading to uncertainty in spend and delays in decision making. The US is more impacted than Europe. Keeping in mind the current environment, we have further expanded our internal efficiency and cost program to work on our pyramid on-site ratio, automation, travel, subcontractor, office consolidation, and on pricing. We anticipate this program will build a path to higher margins in the medium term. We are committed to investing in our people in this period. We are committed to working with our clients as they deal with changes in the economic environment. 
Based on our sustained momentum in financial year 23, a strong pipeline of opportunities, especially focused on cost efficiency and consolidation, while also keeping in mind the uncertain environment, our revenue growth guidance for this financial year is 4% to 7% in constant currency. Our operating margin guidance for this financial year is 20% to 22%. Thank you. With that, let me hand it over to Nilanjan. Uh, thanks, Alan. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining this call. FY23 was a year of two halves, mirroring broader macroeconomic conditions. Growth was extremely strong in H1 with 20% year-on-year constant currency which reduced to 11.2% in H2 due to the slowdown in verticals like telecom, high-tech, retail, and parts of financial services. Q4 came in slower than expected due to some specific client ramp-downs in discretionary spend and delayed client decision-making on new deals. In addition, we had some one-off revenue impacts, including project cancellations, etc. Despite the above, we closed FY23 with a strong 15.4% growth in constant currency, leading to continued market share gains. Operating margins for Q4 and FI23 were at 21% in line with our guidance. Free cash conversion to net profits for FI23 was near 85%. FI23 ETF grew by 1.3% in dollar and 9.7% in INR terms. Client metrics were strong with the number of 50 million clients increasing to 75, 100 million client counts increasing to 40, and 200 million client counts increasing to 15. Long-term uh, LTM voluntary attrition declined to 20.9%. Quarterly annualized attrition reduced by over 4% sequentially and is the lowest in the last nine quarters. This is also well below pre-pandemic levels. Coming to Q4 performance, revenues grew by 8.8% year-on-year and declined by 3.2% sequentially in constant currency terms due to the reasons mentioned earlier. Utilization declined to 80% on the back of softness in demand. We expect the utilization to improve gradually in the coming quarters as pressure start getting deployed. We will calibrate the hiring for FI24 based on available pool of employees, growth expectations, and attrition trends. Q4 margins were 21%, which is a decline of 50 basis points sequentially. Major components of sequential margin movements are we had tailwinds of 50 basis points on cost optimization, including reduction in subcon. Uh, 60 basis points benefit from reduction in PFPS, which is post-sales if customer support, uh, offset by a headwind of about 70 basis points from a drop in utilization, and the balance 90 basis points with a combination of revenue one-timers, as mentioned above, partly offset by other savings. Q4 EPS grew by 0.2% in dollar terms and 9% in rupee terms on a year-on-year basis. Our balance sheet remains strong and debt-free, Consolidated cash and equivalent to that $3.8 billion at the end of the quarter. Free cash flow for the quarter was robust at $713 million with a conversion of 95% to net profit. Yield on cash balance of 6.6% in Q4. The board has recommended a final dividend of Rs. 17.50 per share, which will result in a total dividend of Rs. 34 per share for FI23 versus Rs. 31 per share for FI22, an increase of 9.7% per share for the year. Including the final dividend and recently concluded buyback, we have returned 86% of SPS to shareholders over the last four years under our current capital allocation policy. In Q4, we completed the open market share buyback of 9,300 crore rupees, buying back 1.44% of shares at an average buyback price of rupees 1539 versus a maximum buyback price of rupees 1850. ROE increased to 31.2% in FI23 from 29.1% in net white 22 as a result of higher payout to investors. Coming to segment performance, large yield momentum continued and we signed 17 large yields in Q4. TCV was $2.1 billion with 21% net new. Five large yields were in manufacturing, four in FS, three in CRL, two each in life sciences and high tech, and one in EURS. Region-wise, this was split by 10 in Americas and seven in Europe. In FI24, we signed 95 large deals with TCV of 9.8 billion with 40% net new. Coming to the vertical uh, segment performance, financial services vertical was impacted by budgeting delays at the start of the year, led by macroeconomic uncertainties coupleness, uh, coupled with softness in mortgages, ad- asset management, and investment banking. However, our strong pipeline and large deals in areas like infra, production support, cyber security, 
and business operations resulting in better visibility for FI24. We have a very diverse portfolio of clients in the U.S. and hence exposure to multiple regional banks is less than 2% of our overall revenue. We do not anticipate any material impact on our operations as a result of recent news in regional banking segment. In retail, there is heightened focus on accelerating digital transformation to enable top-line growth with ensuring budgets get spent on right programs to maximize ROI. While there is some pressure on discretionary tech spending, companies are prioritizing investments in key areas such as e-commerce platforms, supply chain management systems, and customer engagement tools. Manufacturing segment continues to ramp up of large wheel wins and benefits of vendor consolidation. There is increased focus on digital spend, including opportunities on ERD, 5G, and industrial IoT. Increased energy prices and interest rates coupled with continuous supply chain disruptions is impacting spends on the run side of the business, especially in Europe. Communication segment is witnessing increased OPEX pressures, cost cutting, ramp downs, and delayed decision making. Demand for ideas and solutions are moving from cost takeout to revenue growth side with heavy focus on customer success. Cloud and mobility remain top drivers for 5G adoption. Overall pipeline remains strong, which gives us the confidence of growth opportunities in the coming quarters. The positive momentum in energy, utilities, resources, and services for FI23 was a bad deal win. Our renewed strategy to repurpose our offerings and developing integrated energy as a service solution and the focus on energy journey to net zero initiative has positioned us well ahead of competition. While we are seeing delays in kicking off discretionary spent projects, the cost takeout and vendor consolidation initiatives continue to pick momentum. We expect our revenues to grow by 4 to 7% in constant currency terms in FI24. Our pipeline of large deals remains extremely strong with increased focus on cost takeout programs. Operating margin guidance stands at 20 to 22 percent. The margin guidance factors in growth assumptions for FI24, impact of utilization, employee cost increases, further normalization of costs like travel, facilities, etc. And we continue to focus on various cost optimization and efficiency improvement measures. As we look beyond FI24, we believe we have various levers to generate more efficiencies like improving utilization, reducing subcons improving pyramid apart from growth acceleration and potential pricing increases which will enable us to aspire for higher margins over time. With that, we can open up the call for questions. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin the question and answer session. Participants who wish to ask a question may press star and one on their touchstone phone. If you are using a speaker phone, please pick up your handset while asking a question. This is required to ensure optimum audio quality on the call. Should your line have any disturbance, you may be asked to return to the question queue if you do not have a clear connection. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. Our first question is from the line of Yogesh Agarwal from HSBC. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, good evening. A uh, couple of questions. Uh, firstly, uh, while the quarter was uh, weak, uh, the guidance at the upper end still looks very solid when we uh, you know, just mathematically look at the sequential build-up from here. So is that 7% based on some macro pickup or is it what you see today 7% is possible? Uh, and related to that, Salim, uh, in general, the demand and the growth picked up post-COVID. So are we back to post uh, pre-COVID growth rates of 5, 6, 7% or FI24 is one of, and we, and we can see a pickup uh, uh, from FY25. Uh, and then I have a follow-up, please. Uh, hi, Yogi, this is Karina. Uh, I didn't catch the second one. I'll go with the first question, then we can just repeat the second one. Um, on the guidance, what we have built it with today is uh, what we see with uh, the deal we have sold and uh, the ongoing work that we have. Uh, and then uh, put the range between 4 and 7%. Uh, there are different uh, scenarios in, in which different things happen. We've widened the band to three points, uh, given uh, the uncertainty uh, in the environment. Uh, we also have a very strong large deal pipeline uh, with some mega deals in the pipeline. Uh, of course, these are uh, always binary, uh, but given the strength of the pipeline, uh, we believe uh, that there is ways that we can achieve uh, the high end uh, of, the, of the band uh, of the guidance. 
got it so i was asking the second question was uh, four to seven is almost going back to pre covid growth rate so is it uh, is it like the new normal again or we can uh, expect some pick up again from fy25 uh, that is one and and also uh, salil i wanted to ask you on the recent management exit uh, just recently you had two presidents and a coo now uh, all three uh, are not there uh, for whatever reasons uh, so has it impacted the business by any chance and is it uh, what's the new structure are you going to replace them or uh, is it uh, uh, is the new structure doesn't need presidents and the coo so on the first one uh, as, as of course you know we, we don't uh, provide a view or a guidance uh, uh, beyond this financial year uh, underlying the way we see the business um, we see two growth drivers uh, and we are well positioned on both in terms of capabilities and track record uh, one is on digital transformation uh, comprising of cloud and other elements and one is on cost efficiency automation uh, and uh, an additional element which is on consolidation that comes in through that uh, we see both of those drivers working uh, we've seen uh, a reduction in the digital transformation uh, uh, work today uh, we see more uh, in the cost and efficiency and consolidation uh, play today but going through uh, depending on where the the client is what the environment is Uh, we feel comfortable for both of those drivers to work uh, over time uh, in terms of the structure uh, we have put in place uh, a structure for the delivery organization uh, which is already rolled out uh, and in the next few weeks we'll roll out the new structure uh, for our ss team so we feel good uh, with the leadership uh, uh, pool that we have within uh, the company uh, who are moving up to take a broader role Uh, and a larger role uh, that they will step up and and deliver uh, what we are driving to very helpful thank you so much anil thank you yeah. our next question is from the line of brian bergen from td cowan please go ahead hi good evening thank you um what are asking the growth outlook first at the midpoint of your 4 to 7% range can you give us a sense on how much of the backlog is already in hand for you having to go out and convert upon the pipeline to achieve that growth target and does the amount that you have to sign in that pipeline to hit the target differ relative to prior years at this time hi uh, this is salil thanks uh, for that um, we we don't have a specific a sort of number there that we uh, share externally and what what i can sort of share is we see a uh, true this past financial year we had a good large deal booking 9.8 billion uh, with 40% net new uh, and we see a, a set of very strong active relationships uh, uh, some of them uh, expanding through the year through other work and then we saw in uh, q4 during the quarter some some ramp downs so keeping those factors in mind we have built uh, the guidance of 4 to 7% uh, and we see uh, that we, we have uh, the ability to to deliver on that guidance okay and and my follow up is kind of a margin here so you cited internal efficiency programs that you're going to progress upon an incrementing office consolidation and, and other items is there a stated target of cost reduction that you're expecting to achieve but so a run rate of out of margin expansion to try to get a sense of how you think about the structural margins of the business assuming the efficiency initiatives you cited so there uh, we put together an internal plan with uh, 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 target and uh, let's say a uh, road map for each of the uh, sub categories that that we outline and a few others uh, and we have a, a view to drive that through uh, the next sort of a period here uh, uh, in the coming quarters uh, we've not shared that target externally 
that our view is to uh, you know make sure that we put in place uh, execute on our program, programs in place uh, and deliver to that uh, in the medium term thank you thank you our next question is from the line of ankur rudra from jp morgan please go ahead hello thank you um the first question is on i uh, just wanted to get a bit more uh, color if you can on the reasons for the very sharp miss on revenues and margins uh, versus the guidance what why did this surprise you um and how much of the demand environment has existed through the quarter uh, or versus what probably came in the last 30 days that's the first one uh this is talil so what we saw there was uh, uh during the quarter as the quarter progressed uh we saw um uh on some clients ramp downs on on programs and this was across uh, different uh, sectors telecom uh, retail high tech uh, and parts of financial services um mortgages uh, investment banking asset management uh, and that was something uh, which were unplanned as we went through uh, and then uh, additionally we had uh, some one time uh, impact uh, which we saw uh, uh, in the quarter as well would you could you be able to elaborate on the one time impact sir yeah so i think firstly the majority of the you know decline is volume led uh, the balance of the revenue is one timers which is a combination of specific client issues including uh, the impact of cancellations as well which is just a top line impact uh, more and more over and above the volume impact so uh, you know that's the state of play uh, really for the quarter okay thank you on the guidance i just wanted to get a sense um, <clears throat> looking at you know what happened in the quarter and the uncertainty uh, in the environment are you turning uh, more conservative uh, for the guidance setting process for f24 uh, both on the revenues and the margins versus what you may have done before and also uh, along with that if you can share what's the visibility that you have at the moment for the full year versus what you may have had you know at the beginning of last year Uh, so there on the guidance uh, we, we took into account uh, you know what, what we see typically uh, as we close the year in march on what we had in new uh, large deals and overall new deals uh, and the ongoing work that we have across uh, our client base uh, and that that uh, uh, basically becomes the foundation of our guidance typically uh, again as, as you know well um, we don't have a detailed uh, view of uh, q3 and q4 so we have uh, more more typically estimates from from uh, uh, other years that that we use and that that's the same approach we use this year from what uh, we see as we look out uh, and, and the same on margin we finished the year at 21% our utilization in q4 uh, is low compared to what uh, we want to target Uh, we have a very strong efficiency and cost program but within that program we are very clear uh, that from an employee perspective we will continue with our commitment with employees uh, and so the utilization will go up uh, through the quarters but in the medium term we will uh, get that impact back into the margin and that's how we build the 20 to 22 margin guidance and so just a last question on the leadership i think this was attempted before but my stabber it would be i mean clearly there's been departures as you uh, you know acknowledge uh, and some of them have gone to competition probably will drive hungrier you know peers going forward um, do you think you're losing muscle and increasing the roles and responsibilities at a more concentrated leadership team i see at least i've seen from the outside at a time where the industry is facing a tougher period this year sorry i'm going to then follow you said will we have concentrated leadership or yeah because i mean i mean the yeah, concentrated leadership has in basically more roles and responsibilities as a as an example on your door or on the legends door versus having three other very senior leaders helping you with a, with a wider leadership team ah okay 
Uh, what, what we have seen uh, and what we know is, you know, within uh, the company, there's a very strong uh, set of leaders uh, uh, across different roles. Uh, many of, so on delivery, many of them have now stepped up, uh, and clearly any any role uh, as you start to step up to uh, delivery leadership within a large company like Infosys uh, becomes more concentrated, uh, and that has been announced and rolled out. Uh, and the same will ha happen with FX, uh, where we are rolling that out uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, the FX uh, segment, of course, uh, you know, is a large segment for us. So those, those will be uh, concentrated in that sense. Uh, so we, we will have a leadership structure with a very uh, strong responsibility for, for several other senior leaders. Understood. Thank you and best of luck. Thank you. Our next question is from the line of Kavaljit Saluja from Kota. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, the first question is on the guidance once again. Uh, you know, is it uh, uh, back-ended uh, or, uh, you know, uh, uh, the guidance assumes even growth uh, through the course of the year? And a related question to the guidance is that given the deterioration in the macro environment uh, along with the huge mess uh, in uh, 4Q along with weak signings, do you think you have been, uh, you know, uh, more, uh, what I would say, watchful in your guidance for FI24? Uh, you know, has the process uh, been tightened? Any thoughts on that would be welcome. Uh, hi, Colonel. This is Salil. On the uh, revenue growth guidance, uh, there, the, the, the thinking is really uh, spread uh, over over the four quarters. Uh, I, I w I'm not sure. I would say uh, it's uh, front or back, but it's based on what we see in the large deals today. Uh, and also uh, in the pipeline that we have, where we do have uh, some mega deals in the pipeline. So that gives uh, some weightage uh, to the guidance. Uh, given uh, where those deals will come, uh, it will be uh, later on in the year itself. Uh, the second one, sorry, Carl, was are we more conservative? Is that the point? No, no. Uh, has the process of uh, guidance uh, been uh, tightened, or rather, you know, the forecasting process has it been tightened given the magnitude of uh, miss uh, in uh, revenues in the quarter, which obviously would have shocked you as well. Uh, you know, have you basically, uh, uh, I mean, built in better cushion, greater cushion in your guidance for FY24, or is the process and the underlying assumptions the way it used to be historically? So we have. Uh try to put in place uh, what is a changing or let not ch changing and uncertain uh, economic environment uh, which uh, where we saw some of these impacts so those factors have been taken in as we build this guidance okay and the second question that I, uh, that I had is on profitability uh, you know uh, every uh, company uh, would uh, you know uh, I mean want to operate at a certain base level of profitability. Uh, now, in Infosys's case, uh, you know, this profitability has been uh, drifting down and uh, the, guide, the profitability guidance is down to 20 to 22%, which is a kind of a new low. Uh, you know, how should one think about uh, 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 underlying operating assumptions behind these, these wins, uh, you know, and the process of bidding for large deals and how does that deal in uh, with the uh, underlying base of profitability aspiration, uh, rather, you know, assumption that you have. And, you know, is this, uh, 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 you know, uh, so how should one think about structural uh, profitability, uh, if you may? Hi, Kamal. Yeah, so I think that if you step back a bit into say, the last year and a half, I mean, basically the whole chasing of this, you know, demand side, uh, you know, three, you know, uh, compensation hike in 15 months, stress salaries, uh, you know, all that in a way has made our structure a bit inefficient, right? Uh, and in a way, a, a part of that today is the reverse that you're sitting at, you know, 80% utilization, whereas you want to be at much higher levels. And the pyramid is not as efficient because you had to get talent from anywhere uh, when the market was hot. So we've seen a lot of these sort of things during this, you know, uh, uh, you know, period where we can identify these pockets subcon, you know, rising to 11 and a half percent. So, I mean, we were clear that we had to go behind, you know, this, uh, the, the, getting the volumes in 
right? And we knew we had time to correct the margin structure, right? And therefore, that's fundamentally what we still believe in. Our guidance is just today at a midpoint that we ended the year at 21, and we have enough flexibility in this guidance between 20 to 22, and you know, in a way, 21 is just a midpoint of that. Uh, to take care of, you know, firstly, of course, there may be some headwinds coming uh, because of compensation. There could be something on travel. But at the same time, you have our levers of improving our utilization at 80%, clearly, which is, uh, you know, probably one of the lowest I've seen. Uh, we have other opportunities of improving the pyramid because, you know, the, the higher bench comes with a double whammy of cost. One is you have the ideal uh, cost of the bench, and at the same time, you have a very rich pyramid. So, the moment you start moving treasures into the pyramid, you get a double benefit of cost that the ID cost goes away from the bench and your quality of the pyramid improves on the production side, right? So you're sitting on, in effect, two inefficiencies now. These are the levers we start using, pricing, et cetera, still going on in conversations, how we build in solar. So our aspiration continues to be that we continue to look at improving margins from where we are. The guidance is just a reflection of it gives us a flexibility in this uncertain year, and we went it at 21, as you saw, consistently during this last uh, year as well. You know, sorry to interrupt you, Niranjan, over there. You know, you see, uncertainty might be there in revenue, but on costs, right, there are only tailwinds, uh, and there are a number of tailwinds that you listed out, uh, and I presume that uh, the labor market has also cooled off. Uh, so why bring down the lower end of the bind, actually? Yeah, so I think also some is that when you some of these levers will take time to put in because it's a different situation of how, many, how much sort of a uh, room you have to deploy levers when you're growing at 10% versus what, when you're growing at 4 to 7%, right? So, for instance, your pressures, how fast can you deploy them when you're growing at 4% is a different pace versus what you're deploying at 7 versus what you're deploying at 10, right? So all that will still weigh into the structure. It's not that you can immediately say, I'm going to overnight change my utilization you know, from 80 to 85, you know, or shift the on-site offshore, because in a way, a slower volume regime you know, has that you know, uh, you know, overhang on, on how fast can we deploy. But like I said, when we started, that we are sitting on these inefficiencies which are very visible to us. Uh, and we know we can uh, deploy many of these uh, you know, sort of levers which we have to continue to aspire for higher margin profile. Hmm. Okay, got that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next question is from the line of Pankaj Kapoor from CLSA. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. <clears throat> Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, Nilanjan, just continuing on Kamaljit's question around margins, uh, two things. One, uh, what kind of a time frame are you looking at for this year's VHI? Are you sticking to first quarter? Uh, and uh, what kind of a quantum are you expecting? What kind of a margin impact do you foresee of that? Will it be similar to last year, or do you think this could be lower this year? Yeah, so this will be continuously evaluated. Uh, if we have built in, like I mentioned, into our guidance uh, compensation, and we will take a uh, decision during the year as well, looking at the you know market context, the competitive context. Uh, so no decision has been taken as yet. So the uh, the hike may not happen in the first quarter. Is that what you're saying? Uh, at this moment, no decision has been taken for the hike. Understood. And in the at the lower end of the guidance, are you keeping a buffer for some kind of a potential pricing pressure that might come in during the course of the year? Is that the is that the headwind which you see as the major one when you are guiding for a 20% floor? Uh, I don't think, I mean, it's specifically anything on pricing. I think it's just that we are, you know, at 21%, uh, and the midpoint we, uh, between 20 to 24 just happens to be 21. And like I said, there may be some headwinds, there may be some tailwinds. And, of course, the aspiration is continuing to do better than, you know, uh, our margins as well. So nothing specific like that in terms of uh, pricing uh, you know, contingency or something. Okay. Salil, if I look at the net new deal wins, probably this was the lowest since we had from the start of the pandemic. I mean, was this mainly due to clients delaying decisions on deal uh, awards at, towards the last, say, 30 days? or uh, And are you building any kind of a conversion to get to that 7% at the upper end of the guidance? So there, uh, one of the things we have seen in the pipeline uh, is 
a slowing in decision making so uh, large deals uh, staying in the pipeline uh, longer uh, having said that uh, the net new or even the quantum of large deals as, as we discussed in the past there is always volatility because these are only deals uh, over 50 million and not everything it's not a full full uh, let's say booking value uh, and so we've always seen that that volatility uh, in the past uh, we think with the large deal pipeline that we have today which which happens to be a very large pipeline uh, and some mega deals in it Uh, we have the ability to drive uh, to 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 our margin uh, sorry our growth guidance uh, as we run through the year so uh, just to clarify uh, at the upper end of the guidance we are expecting some of those mega deals to convert during the course of the year um we, we i would not be so specific uh, in that uh, to, to say uh, what it is based on we do have a large pipeline with uh, mega d uh, and we anticipate that uh, some of those uh, uh, will allow us to get uh, get to the uh, higher band of the uh, guidance understood thank you thank you our next question is from the line of abhishek bandari from namura please go ahead yeah thank you for the opportunity uh really and even you know uh, this quarter we had certain unanticipated you know external events you know that led us to miss our guidance of 16 to 16 and a half especially you know after we had upgraded at the end of q3 do you think you could have considered issuing a profit warning you know citing it was beyond your control uh you know because this time the miss seems to be fairly uh, you know sudden and uh, shocking in the third fourth quarter so i think if you see the full year we said 16% uh, and we had 15.4 and we said 21% margin and we were at 21% as well so uh, i'm not sure much just no question reference to no you know where i was coming from you know we had uh, raised the band at the end of q3 you know we signaled you know we possibly had better execution you know uh, under control of course things have changed there are macro situations beyond our control and you know uh, there were some cancellations so as a good practice do you yeah, think this evolved uh, during the quarter right so the situation also has evolved during the quarter it's not as if suddenly on one day you know, we wake up and suddenly see that the volume went down this is a situation during the uh, quarter as well okay uh the second question is uh, uh you know sarel i think in the press conference you mentioned uh, you know mna could be an opportunity where you know some of the uh, global companies could consider selling the captives uh do you foresee a you know meaningful deployment of capital for that particular purpose this year are there enough number of uh, you know such captive conversations uh, in your pipeline so on mna uh i think we have with a strong balance sheet the ability to uh, do something small or medium uh, or large uh, today we are in uh, let's say we, we look at many opportunities uh, we will see how those fit in uh, there are various sort of components to it a strategic fit of course uh, valuations which are much more reasonable today uh, cultural fit uh, of those companies and the ability for us to integrate that in uh, and so all, all of those we'll keep in mind uh, and and if it sort of you know meets meets those uh, points for us uh, we will look at those opportunities thank you salil and all the best thank you Bye. our next question is from the line of ashwin mehta from ambit capital private limited please go ahead hi thanks for the opportunity uh, Uh, so sir uh, what is the nature of this one off uh, client issue and will this reverse out like we saw last year in the same quarter uh, where we took a client uh, contract provision uh, secondly is it a single client or multiple client issue that we are talking about uh, uh, and uh, in which segment uh, have you seen this client issue and i have a follow up Yeah, so like i said earlier this is uh, you know one of client uh, issue revenue issues and there are num- number of clients 
Uh, it's a mixture of clients and some of it is uh, a provision against them. Some may come back, some may not come back. And some of it is also linked to cancellation, uh, right? Uh, because the revenue impact also beyond the volume impact of cancellation. Yeah, I mean, it is, uh, there is a mixture of uh, clients there. Uh, and the 10% decline that we've seen in US telecom, uh, is it related to this, uh, these client issues? Because that appears to be a pretty steep decline. Uh, 10% decline in? Uh, in the US telecom business of yours? Yeah. No, I don't think uh, anything specific in coming out of these uh, issues really. Okay. And the last one is, if I look at your guidance, uh, uh, it implies a 2.9% sequential growth over the next four quarters. Uh, the last we saw this X of the COVID surge was in FY16. Uh, so what drives such a high growth comfort for us uh, in an uncertain uh, environment? Uh, sorry, just say that again, please. I didn't follow that. So the CQGR requirement for your top end of guidance is around 2.9% sequential every quarter. Uh, this is something that X of FY22 we've seen last in FY16. Uh, so in an uncertain demand environment, uh, what drives such a high growth comfort? So there, uh, what we've seen with our guidance is uh, we, we have uh, some good large deals uh, that we closed in, this, in the previous financial year, and we have a pipeline uh, which gives us a uh, large pipeline, several of them mega deals, uh, the uh, opportunity to have those uh, come into our mix uh, and give us a flow uh, through the year. So would you say the sub $50 million deal flow is where the traction is much stronger than what appears in the greater than $50 million deal flow that we announced typically? Uh, I, I, we don't have a view uh, that we share typically on the non-large deal. Uh, but our large deal uh, is one of the components that we use to build out the guidance. Sure, sir. Uh, thanks a lot and all this. Thank you. Our next question is from the line of Gaurav Rapiria from Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, thanks for taking my question. So first is a uh, conversion of the order book to revenue. If I look at your fiscal 23, you entered the year with a net new deal win of roughly $3.8 billion, which generated incremental revenues of $1.9 billion. You're entering fiscal 24 with a net new deal means of $3.9 billion, which is pretty similar to last year. But the guidance implies uh, incremental revenues of a $1 billion at the midpoint. Just trying to understand that what has changed that is driving significant downtick in the incremental revenue with a very similar net new deal wins in your book. Yeah, so I think also part of it is the uh, net new wins and the phasing of that, right? And I think uh, in FY22, you would have seen them more towards the, uh, you know, throughout the year. And if you're seeing in FY23, uh, I think the quarter, last quarter, for instance, somebody has also mentioned as a you know has been a weaker quarter because there's usually a four to six month gap between that deal and right before it comes into revenue. So I think partly is the phasing, but the underlying I think we've had strong deal wins on both sides and the percentage of net new. I think part of the question answer is that the way the net new has shown during the year. So it's to do with the ACV growth being weaker than the TCV growth. Is that like a fair understanding? Uh, could be, could not be also timing of it, right? So I'm just saying that in the net new, like for instance in quarter four, as somebody has mentioned, is about 22%. So that will reflect in FY24 going forward initially, and then 
of course, as new deals ramp up, that's a separate uh, uh, volume impact. But the phasing of the wind within that is also to be seen. Of where did the net news come? Got it. The second question is around the comment that you made around the stabilization that you have seen in March. So, is it fair to say that your guidance is assuming things are likely to improve sequentially from here on, and uh, this is the worst, or it's difficult to say that? Uh, divorce is behind us. Uh, yeah, at this stage we are not saying uh, uh, I, uh, any of those things. Uh, what we are saying is we saw some uh, signalizing that the environment is uncertain. Uh, so we are watchful and agile. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons we've expanded the margin, uh, sorry, the growth guidance band to three points uh, is to take that into account. All right. Last question from me on the margin. So, how much of the margin downtick is uh, primarily a cost-led issue, which will rectify over a period of time, and how much it is a kind of flexibility you have given to yourself to go after the deals, which may have a fundamental different contract profitability? Thank you. Wow, that's a fantastic question. <laughs> uh, uh, like I said, I mean, we explained how we done the margin guidance. We went it at 21. Um, that is the midpoint of 20 to 22. We have some headwinds. Uh, we have some tailwinds. And this margin uh, allows us uh, that flexibility as well. Of course, we continue to aspire to improve that. Thank you. We'll take a next question from the line of Sudhir Guntapalli from uh, Kotak Mahindra Asset Management. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, good evening. Uh, thanks, Indian, for the opportunity. A uh, couple of clarifications. Uh, uh, due to unplanned rundowns and cancellations, uh, uh, you said we had seen a sharp 3.2% fall in the revenue. Uh, however, margins fell just 50 basis points. And even based on the apportioning of margins you gave, Utilization and cancellation led impact even so much in proportion uh, to 3.2% uh, fall in revenue. Uh, logically, this decline of this magnitude should have entailed a much bigger margin impact given the cost recalibration is difficult in the near term. So just curious, is there any sizable pass-through element which would have gotten rolled off, which would have also led to the revenue decline? Or is there any deferred cost component which will come and hit us in the subsequent quarters? No, so we, as we went through the margin walk uh, earlier, if you go back to our script, uh, we've explained the four key elements. I think they're quite clear of how the margin has moved from 21.5 to 21. Sure. And, and uh, the second part, uh, the reason why I'm also asking about this pass-through component is uh, the SVD scare and the sentiment overhang sort of unfolded from 10th March, uh, post which there were 12 to 15 working days. And the revenue was almost three and a half to four percent short of guidance or expectations, which means there is a hundred and eighty million dollar revenue stream. Looks quite a bit uh, for twelve to fifteen working days of invoicing. Uh, so again, uh, put it conversely, is there a deferred revenue component which can come in the subsequent quarter? Since you also mentioned somewhere about the provision reversal of one off. No, I'm not getting clear clear in your question really. Yeah. No, what I was asking was uh, uh, the, the in general the macro sentiment overhang unfolded uh, in the last. No, no, we, no, no. They, I, I think I, did you say that whether all this shortfall of three and a half has happened in the last like yeah. month or something like that? No. Yeah. Uh, so, so you are saying the three and a half percent shortfall is uh, evenly spread from the beginning of the quarter itself, and not necessarily. Of course, even. Yeah, of course, the one-timer is a different issue, but the biggest, the majority of the drop in revenue is because of volume. And like Sarel said, this was pretty much after 15, and we've actually seen March stabilizing. So it was in the initial uh, half of the uh, of the uh, quarter. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Our next question is from the line of Surendra Goyal from City Group. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, good evening. So my first question was on the revenue guidance. Just wanted to confirm that the guidance is all organic in nature. Uh, yes, the guidance is all organic. Yeah. And and uh, second question is on margin uh, for Nilangan. 
So while I understand that your guidance is always annual, but how do you really think about medium term margins, right? So the common question we have been getting from investors, given the direction of margins is, can it be 18% couple of years down the line? So I know you can't quantify it, but, but just wanted to understand how you guys think about medium term margins. Yeah, I think uh, I think I'd explained it earlier in the question to Kaval as well. Uh, you know, you know, if you have to step back and you see, you know, during this period of COVID, uh, you know, for us to go after in a very talent uh, constrained environment, uh, the impact on the cost structure of the company all across, you know, per capita cost went up. Pyramid got, uh, you know, with the combination of compensation stretches, Pyramid got, uh, you know, skewed. Uh, you know, uh, basically, fundamentally, you are going behind these large beams. You don't have time to really optimize on all these levers. Upcon, you know, at a record 11.3%. All these inefficiencies we saw, but like we had continuously said during that period that we knew that we had to go and grab that volume and we would have enough time to subsequently, as we start, uh, you know, unwinding those inefficiencies. And this is a cost optimization program we run uh, throughout, you know, uh, and that's where. We still think these you know, inefficiencies still exist uh, across. Uh, utilization is a classic one, and we're sitting today at 80%, as we mentioned, uh, and it's got a double whammy on cost, uh, like I mentioned earlier. So these are things we will continue to target on and aspire to improve uh, our margin. And 20 to 22 really gives us that uh, flexibility, and 21 just happens to be the midpoint where we ended uh, the year. Uh, sure, Nivan. And I get the annual guidance. My question was more uh, medium term because in good demand scenario, margins go down because of supply side issues. And in bad demand scenario, possibly they go down because of uh, either pricing or, or whatever other reason. So maybe I just take it offline. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from the line of Keith Bachman from BMO Capital. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you. I had two questions also. Could you talk about what the growth rate of the backlog in the pipeline was during the March quarter and how that differed during the December quarter? I'm just trying to understand the, the magnitude. You called out volume as the major driver, but, but how did it you know, impact the overall backdrop? And within that context, could you give us a sense of you called out there were several one-time events for customers. Could you give a quantification about what that was in the quarter? Uh, yeah, so we don't quantify that, but like I said, the majority uh, has been because of volumes and the balance uh, has been because of the one-time of the cross clients, some of them related to cancellation and other, uh, you know, provisions. Okay. But you don't want to give a characterization of what that was, you know, those, those cancellations or a quantification of it? No, I don't think anything else we have to add. I'm just... Okay, okay. Um, I wanted to, my second question then relates to pricing. And the previous question, I think, was trying to get at this, and I'm not sure I understood the answer. But if you think about the guidance that you provided, on the one side, perhaps I would think that you get COLA benefits associated with your contracts, but a lot of your customers, frankly, are experiencing the same economic weakness you are and therefore could negotiate in the tougher pricing as we look at over the next 12 months. In other words, want price reductions because they're experiencing economic pain as well. So maybe just talk, how are you thinking about like for like pricing uh, as you look at over the next 12 months in terms of the forecast that you provided or the guidance, excuse me, that you provided. Yeah, so I think if you uh, see pricing in general, and I won't say, you know, you know how much of the pricing element has been built in. Uh, so this is a program we started about a year and a half back. Uh, and it is a combination of two or three things. One is, uh, you know, the renewal discounts, which clients come back when, you know, programs are ending. And uh, basically, after productivity increases at the renewal stage, uh, which we are just loosely calling discounts. Now, that is something which we have really curbed over the last you know, few years, uh, basically pushing back on the renewal because there are other 
ways we can get productivity as well. So that's something which has actually, uh, you know, stemmed quite a lot. Uh, in fact, clients understand that we have to also provide for our own talent and in this you know, hot talent market to compensate their teams. Uh, so that's something which we've learned to appreciate as well. So that's one part of it. Second is a program which we run uh, on basically digital pricing where we're going after new digital deals. Uh, and this is a combination of, you know, how we've changed our pricing models into linking with, for instance, we newly acquired subsidiaries which have higher pricing. It could be more pod-based pricing, outcome-based pricing. Uh, there are new innovative pricing constructs, so that's second. Third is simple hygiene work of, you know, having cola clauses into our, uh, you know, MSAs. And of course, how much you can execute and implement is a different question, but at least with that and deals going in, at least you have a starting point to negotiate uh, with the client uh, as well. So it's all three we look at uh, in terms of existing deals, new deals, and renewals. Uh, and of course, you have clients where we are able to push this to a great level. Some clients ask for that to be plowed back into the employee set. In some clients, in between the markets, uh, of course, who are going through their own, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, concerns on their environment, it may be more difficult. Uh, and therefore, it's literally also for courses in which we go literally client by client to see where we can get uh, an improvement in the underlying RPP realization. And so what is the underlying assumption associated with the guidance for FY24, and how is that different uh, on what you've experienced in FY24? Yeah, so we don't, we, yeah, so absolutely, we don't break, our, break down our guidance into volume and price, if you want to call it that way. Uh, that's all factored into the overall guidance. Like I say, yeah, more just directional. Is it you know the same, better, or worse? Just kind of directional barometer. Yeah, we, we would expect pricing to improve, right? Now you know, I can't give you a sense of you know versus last year how much will this improve, but uh, yes, we have the pricing improvements built into our overall plan. Okay, fair enough. Many thanks. Thank you. Our next question is from the line of Abhishek Kumar from JM Financial. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, good evening, and thanks uh, for taking my question. Uh, we've seen uh, some divergence uh, in, in uh, the client behavior that we have talked about versus what some of our larger peers have, have spoken about. Um, uh, one, uh, we have seen March uh, stabilizing, uh, while what we heard yesterday uh, that March actually deteriorated. And second, uh, the discretionary spend uh, you know, for peers has actually got deferred and not canceled. But we have seen certain cancellation in the project. So in that context, just wanted to understand the nature of, uh, you know, these projects which are being cancelled. Are these uh, discretionary or there are also uh, vendor consolidation uh, deals where uh, we might have lost to uh, uh, so, so the um, what we shared was some of the uh, projects or programs were uh, stopped in an unplanned way uh, during uh, the course uh, of the quarter. Uh, th these are uh, uh, not resulting from uh, vendor consolidation. These are resulting from decisions uh, that the clients have typically made on, on their spend, uh, given the uh, environment that they are facing. Okay, okay. Uh, sure. Uh, thank you, and all of us. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the last question for today. I now hand the conference over to the management for closing comments. Over to you, sir. So thanks. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us. Uh, uh, as we shared through the call, uh, first, for the full year, we, we had uh, good growth, uh, good margin, good cash collection. Uh, we saw uh, during the quarter uh, some uh, uh, situations uh, which which were uh, new situations during the quarter with the um, changing environment. Uh, we have a strong guidance for next year, four to seven percent of growth. Uh, we have a good guidance on on margin. We've put in place uh, even more emphasis on a cost and efficiency plan which has many components uh, uh, at a detailed level, and we uh, look to see that benefit come through uh, over a, a multi-year period and aspire to uh, higher margins. 
Uh, and we have uh, an extremely strong pipeline with uh, large deals uh, and some mega deals, uh, especially on cost efficiency automation. Uh, with that, we feel uh, the business uh, remains uh, in a good position uh, and we have the ability to work through uh, different environments uh, on digital transformation uh, and or on cost efficiency consolidation uh, as, as the course of the year develops. And so we look forward to executing on that and, and connecting with you uh, at the end of uh, this Q1. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Infosys Limited, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us, and you may now disconnect your lines.